Good afternoon. Um, I'm Barbara Bodine, and I have the pleasure and the honor to be the director of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown University. And I want to welcome everyone to our to today's installment of our Diverse Diplomacy Leaders Speakers Series. Former ISD Rust Fellow Carol, Carolyn Savage started the Diverse Diplomacy Series in 2018 to celebrate the diversity of the Department of State and the US Foreign Service, as well as provide a forum to discuss the opportunities and the obstacles that face all of us as we seek to build a more representative foreign affairs community. Through this forum, we engage with leaders from diverse communities to discuss careers in diplomacy, including those uh, for, uh, minorities, women, LGBTQ+, and first-generation Americans. This is part of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy's broader mandate to connect students with career foreign policy professionals to better understand the rewards and the challenges of a career in foreign policy. This session is brought to you as part of an Una Chapman Cox Foundation project on American diplomacy and the Foreign Service. This year, we started our series with a fascinating conversation with Carmen Cantor, who is the current US ambassador to Micronesia. And those of you who are not able to join us, um, I would recommend it to you. It will be loaded on diversediplomacy.com within the next two weeks. I'm very excited to keep things rolling with another inspiring and thought-provoking interview and thrilled that we'll be joined today by Ambassador Donald Yamamoto, who is an absolute legend in the Foreign Service. Um, and who just recently retired after a, an incredible 41 year career. This is such a unique opportunity for our audience to, who, to hear from someone who can speak from an insider's perspective and be able to do it with the frankness and freedom that comes with having left government service. <laughs> By way of background, Ambassador Yamamoto was one of the youngest members of the Foreign Service to achieve the rank of career minister. He served as US ambassador to Somalia from 2018 until earlier this year. And prior to his retirement, he led the State Department's complex Afghanistan evacuation process at Dulles Airport, tackling some of the toughest issues uh, and some of the, the greatest humanitarian challenges until the very end of his career in very classic Yamamoto fashion. Don was previously acting assistant secretary of state for African affairs, actually twice, principal deputy assistant secretary of state for Africa. He served as senior vice president for international programs and outreach at the National Defense University Senior Advisor to the Director General of the Foreign Service on Personnel Reform, which is very apropos today, and also Chargé at our mission in Somalia in 2016. He's held senior positions in Kabul, Mazar Sharif, and Bagram, Afghanistan, and was Ambassador to Ethiopia and Djibouti, and Ambassador at Interim in Eritrea. From Seattle, um, Washington Ambassador Yamamoto is an undergraduate and graduate degree holder from Columbia and has studied Chinese, Japanese, Arabic, and French, and has won the Robert Frazier Memorial Award for Advancing Conflict Resolution in Africa. In other words, Ambassador Yamamoto is one of the most accomplished, and I will say one of the most respected diplomats in the US Foreign Service. And I'm very honored to have this colleague and my friend with us today. So you have an extraordinary career, Don. What initially attracted you to, the foreign, to foreign affairs? What steps, what processes led you to decide on this uh, career? In other words, what is your origin story? 
And thank you very much, Ambassador Bodine, and, and really to your team. It's this very it's a great honor, and, and thank you very much for everything you've done for the service and, and for Georgetown. Uh, there's, in, in response to your question, there's really two um, areas I want to kind of highlight. When I was a student at Columbia, I was actually doing chemistry, biochemistry, and mathematics, and so it was very different. But I was influenced by um, these foreign service officers who were fired during their time in China. Uh, and during the Senator McCarthy uh, hearings at the Senate in the 50s, uh, they were blamed for losing China to the communists. And yet they never lost their dedication to duty. And one of the things of talking to like William O. Club and others who worked in the embassy was that despite what they faced, they still have a love for the service. And I think that was really fascinating. And I had one other person that I talked to was Begnev Brzezinski, who was maybe the National Security Advisor to President Carter. Um, the other issue too was my, my parents, a great influence. They said that in duty to others, in service to others and to really help. So my mother's family is very interesting. Um, they were, their family was taken from their homes and put in camps in Western United States, in California and other places, because their crime was that they were of Japanese descent uh, during World War II. Um, two of her uncles uh, signed the, um, uh, signed uh, you know, papers to say the, uh, declare oath to the United States. And they joined the 100th Infantry, 442nd uh, mm -hmm. Regimental Command, combat unit and fought in Europe for the last two years of the war. Uh, and that was, you know, dedication. And they came back and they said, yes, their families were in camps. They lost everything, I mean, homes, everything. But they still said, we need to do service so that this doesn't happen again. And that was very interesting. And my mother was uh, caught in the war in Japan. And so she did not know what happened to her family in the United States. And she was under really house arrest because of her American passport and she was Catholic. And so, but the United States helped her get back and they unified. And then one thing is my, my dad, he lost almost everyone in his family. He was a Japanese army officer. And, and so he went to, what was he going to do after the war? The United States gave him a scholarship to study at Washington, Washington State. And he went. And what other country would do that? And I think from that point, he said, this is the United States. I want our kids to dedicate and to support and really to help this country that gave us so much. Thank you. That, that's a remarkable story. Um, and I, I will say for, for some of our, our younger participants, um, the 442 was one of the most highly decorated army units during the entire war and also took some of the heaviest casualties. Um, before we dive further into the questions, um, I want to ask our audience to start thinking about questions that you might have for Ambassador Yamamoto. We'll begin taking the questions um, a little in a few minutes. And if you could uh, go to the Q&A box on your uh, laptop computer and indicate your name and your affiliation with your question. So start thinking now. Um, can you tell us um, a little bit more about how you see yourself, um, how you think others saw you uh, within the foreign affairs world, and how did your identity shape your approach to your work? Thank, thank you for the question. The, being in the foreign service really has been a learning experience, which continues even today, even though I'm retired, uh, a love for for what the United States stands for and what it means to others, it's, it's brand. Um, and during over 41 years of service, we did some really amazing things. And I don't think any other profession would allow us to do these things. So I know I worked for the secretary in the operations center and we had really a, just a, a devastating year. The 25th anniversary, we had uh, attacks into Syria, to Libya, uh, the bombings in uh, Germany, the Achille Laurel, uh, the shuttle Challenger explosion. It was just really a remarkable, it's a learning experience and, and we just really had to learn on the ground. And those experiences really helped shape who we are as Americans and more important, the things that we face. It also helped us become better officers. 
After that, I was the human rights officer in Tiananmen Square in China in 1989, and really seeing how the Chinese operated, how undemocratic the process was, but also historic. It was the first time that Gorbachev was going to meet with um, Yang Shangkun uh, and the other leaders of the Politburo. It was a second meeting. The first one was uh, by Khrushchev and uh, Mao Zedong. Then the other issue too is the tragedies in 98, we had the uh, embassy bombings of embassy Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. And, and I worked with our colleagues for three to four months on the operation center, not only recovery, repatriation of the remains of our lost fallen colleagues, but also of our local staff and the Kings and Tanzanians who suffered too. We had 5,000 Kenyans who had suffered during those attacks. Uh, and then, and recently, of course, after 9-11, working with our allies and uh, U.S. military and interagency colleagues uh, on the war on terrorism. But more important, it, it, by us explaining and teaching and learning, they also learn from us, interagency, our colleagues, our host nations about what we do as diplomats. And, and more important is that they saw us as all Americans. And uh, as our French colleagues were saying, we are all Americans after this conflict in 9-11. And so those are some of the, I think, very different experiences than I think my colleagues faced in the 80s and the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, but did, did you ever feel that uh, you encountered any bias or discrimination, um, either from your colleagues or sometimes serving abroad in other countries um, as an Asian American diplomat? Do you think- Yes. And it's your career. Yeah. So when I joined the Foreign Service, the the service was very different. And in some ways, it has, has not changed. In other ways, it has changed. So we had, in the senior ranks, over 87% of the officers were Caucasian, mostly male. And in the rest of the Corps, it was really over 85, 86% Caucasian. And there was really no one who looked like me. In fact, when I was entered the service, uh, I was we had one other um, Asian American and an I, we had six African Americans in my class. So it, it was very difficult. When I went to my first tour, they kept, one of my supervisors said, oh, you're not one of us. And really? I said, yes, yes, I said, you're not one of us. Really is stay there in the counselor section. So I think if you don't show respect and honor to those who are working in your service, the host nation and your allied countries also take the same cue. And that was in the 80s and the 90s. And it really changed, I think, after 9-11, especially as Colin Powell and Secretary Rice and, and Clinton started to diversify and open up the core. But before then, it was a very male-dominated uh, area. The other issue, too, is diversity is not just ethnicity uh, and race, but it's also where you come from. And of mm -hmm. course, the core had majority of all the officers and staff came from 20 schools, mostly Ivy Leagues, and that's changing. The other issue too is it was basically coastal and we didn't get a lot of people from the internal areas. So that's really kind of, and I think other questions we can kind of delve into those uh, areas, but so diversity really is multifaceted and has to be very looked at uh, in a multifaceted uh, area. How would you, um, you, you've obviously seen progress. I think we've, we've both seen progress over the course of our respective careers. Um, I, do, I noticed that you, you, know, you, you worked for the, the Director General uh, for a while and I presume that was Linda Thomas-Greenfield? It was after her and also to <clears throat> Arnie Chacon. And then okay. when he left, it was to Bill Todd. So it's really kind of spanning a lot of people. Spanning a lot of people. So um, you've seen the, the efforts that the department has taken uh, to not only recruit, but I think as we're increasingly aware to retain um, a, a very diverse um, uh, um, foreign service community. What do you think we do right? And, and what do you think we need to do better or different? A lot of it is us, but also it is also on, on, I guess, our education system as well. I'll give you a couple of examples on both sides. 
So I recruited a lot for the State Department during these years and I went to places like Alabama, up to the rural areas of Mississippi and I um, mean uh, Minnesota and Washington State. And, you know, just meeting, it doesn't matter if they were African-American, Hispanic, or Caucasian, especially in Alabama, it's like, the question they ask is, well, why do I want to join the Foreign Service? What is it that you guys do that's going to affect me or my family, my life? Mm -hmm. And this really kind of brings to the question is, um, and I tell the young officers, when I was the ambassador in Ethiopia, we had Hurricane Katrina, and we had the Louisiana delegation coming in. And they could not understand why we gave foreign assistance. I mean, they understood the importance of it, but they said they needed money to help their people in New Orleans recover. So the issue comes in is if we can't make what we do important to that single mom with three kids in California or that unemployed coal miner in West Virginia or the, or the manufacturer person who just lost his job in Detroit, then we got a problem. And so mm -hmm. it's much, so that area is that we need to uh, bring in more people and to diversify how we approach the foreign service. And, you know, the average age for people entering the service is 32 to 35, which mm -hmm. means they've had other careers, which means we're getting people who have gone into other areas rather than right out of college. And that I think maybe we need to look more at how we do teaching in colleges. Like Georgetown is great, but not everything, everyone is Georgetown. Right. The, the other, yeah, the other area too is diversity. So diversity is really fascinating is, is that without the, what Colin Powell and the secretaries recently have done is if we didn't have the Pickering, the Wrangell uh, scholarship programs, we would have very, very few diversity candidates in the service, very few. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. So we need to, to bring in at the exam uh, system as well. But let me just say that the Wrangell and the Pickering, they are a very high level type of officers. And we see a higher attrition rate among them. And so therefore mm -hmm. we need to look at how we're gonna retain them. The, the other issue too is on women. Did you know that in for many years, especially in the, after 9-11, we had more women than men pass a foreign service test. Mm -hmm. But we could never get 40% of the women taking the oath of office. Why? Why is that? And those are areas that we need to look at. And the final point is in the recent four years, and, and we, we struggle with Secretary Tillerson and Secretary Pompeo, is that the goal was to uh, eliminate 1,972 slots. Uh, and the reason why was because it was a budget issue and to trim down the operations. Secretary Pompeo kind of revised it, but still we lost a lot of officers. You can't build a really diversified uh, service if you don't have the commitment to really hiring the best you can. And by downsizing, you send a wrong message. And so those are some of the problems we face. Yeah, I think, and with the downsizing, you also add the workload to those who are less because our, our workload did not go down proportionally. Yeah. Um, and so people just end up um, exhausted. Um, I, you know, I think the department has done a lot on, on trying to focus recruitment in terms of the communities, the geography, the socioeconomic, but there seems to be an increasing problem with retention that it's, as you say, more women than men passed the test, but only 40% then took the oath. And then if you, if you look at the non-Caucasian male percentages, they decrease as people go up, they're not staying. What are we doing wrong on retention and what should the department be looking at on that? It's something we, we talked about ambassadors. Um, the service is very young. Uh, because we did not hire very many in the 90s and the early 2000s, mm -hmm. the end result is that you're seeing a lot of people who are retiring. Uh, and so therefore we're losing our really good mentors. And so yeah. the core right now is at one point we had over 65% with less than 10 years of service. Mm -hmm. It's obviously, it's, it's less, it's getting better. And then two thirds of them had less than five years. You can't run a ship with that many people 
who don't have the uh, experience and to look at, at the things that we have to do or we're calling on our people to do. And so mentoring and uh, coaching be, become the challenge. The other area too is, um, is, is really opening up opportunities. And so I'll give you an example is, so the Africa Bureau, each of the regional bureaus really have, has the ability to control a lot of positions. And so the Africa Bureau, we made the effort to say, listen, if you want a good solid major league team, you better have a good you know, AAA team and a bench. And so what we did was we made sure that our unit chiefs, our counselors, DCMs were not only diverse, but but really, it, it, you're not just saying we're, we're going to pick this because they're women. No, we're picking the best and the brightest who happen to be women or happen to be diverse candidates. And so we ended up with 40% of our deputy chief submission were women. Mm -hmm. And our diversity candidates was over 30%. So if you look at the entire core, the number of women at the DCM level is, is I would say at that time, was under 20%, 20%. That's not good. You can't build a senior level if you don't have enough of yeah. these who look like us and, or, or that people in these groups. And that's the issue that we need to correct. We are slowly correcting it, but it's going to take time. The issue comes in, do we have time? Mm -hmm. and, and do we have the commitment? And, and that comes from the leadership. Yeah. And I think that's, that's one, of the, one of the issues that both you and I have seen is that the the words are often there, but the commitment and the sustainability of that commitment tends to, to wax and wane. And under the, the previous administration, there, there did not seem to be any effort to, um, to, to get that AAA team, to get that bench, uh, to, to grow the farm team that you need. Uh, um, I think Secretary Kerry famously once said, you know, where do we get the next Bill Burns? Well, you don't get him, you grow him. And what you're talking about is what your bureau did to, to grow people uh, so that they can take these positions. You, you mentioned mentorship, and I think that's critically important. Could you just talk about some of your own mentors, your own champions over the years, how they influenced you? And then a little bit more, because I know that you have been a very active mentor to, to many, many other officers. Yeah, and it's, it's about really engaging and giving to the service. And so I would call them influencers as well as mentors and coaches. And they come from all different aspects and background. Um, when I came into the Africa Bureau, Susan Rice was our assistant secretary and she really just took an interest in all the people serving. And she really pushed me to be an ambassador. I said, uh, with all due respect, Madam Assistant Secretary, I don't think I qualify. I, I just don't qualify. And she said, that's your mistake. If I say you do, you do. And we had a lot of people. Um, Lynn Thomas Greenfield was great. Connie Newman, who came from AID, Johnny Carson, Tom Pickering mm -hmm. was great. And so yeah. but these are senior people. And Secretary Colin Powell and Secretary Rice really did a lot of things that were different. So when I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary, we Secretary Powell used to bring us up for private discussions just on Africa. And then he would walk around and he would know your name. And I mean, that's mm -hmm. a very unique leader. Uh, Secretary Rice was the same way, walking around and just talking to us. So those are some of the people that, and then we have to give back. We have 54 missions and consulates in, in Africa, about uh, 1,250 officers and staff, 3,200 interagency. And one of the things when I was a PDAS and the assistant secretary is, is I knew every ambassador, I knew every DCM by name, and I visited 31 countries. I should have visited more, I could have. And Johnny Carson visited every embassy, I mean, everything. Wow. He, he, he's an amazing person. Uh, and, and so did uh, Prince and Lyman, it was great. Mm -hmm. and so constantly talking and, but also holding people accountable to who, as leaders. So we, we did fire some people because they didn't lead, but we also praised people and honored them and really promoted them. 
and those leaders. And then we also looked at young officers and helped them grow and develop. That's what we try to do and we continue to do. Actually, you you bring up something that we don't normally talk about, but I think it's important um, because we're generally looking at the positive, the mentoring, the influencers. You know, how do you how do you help grow yourself, and how do you help grow others? Um, but there has been some conversations about accountability and how hard it is to either hold um, either just the chronic underperformer, which unfortunately every organization has, but sometimes people who do more than just underperform, uh, they are, they transgress uh, Mm -hmm. in any number of ways. And what are your views on that? Particularly since it, it seems to affect or, or be targeted at women and underrepresented groups uh, right. disproportionately. So, so here's the issue. Um, they made me a political officer and, and I'm a scientist and, and, you know, reading and writing is great, but I would be much better in the science and tech, but I had some really great mentors, but I'll give you one example. So we had a, a female officer coming from another bureau. She was on the selection outboards. She was on her way out of the service. And we found out that, you know, She's not a political officer. She does not have the skill sets. What she does have is she has good people skills. And so the end result is we made her public diplomacy and she is an amazing officer today. It's trying to find that right fit, actually talking to people and coaching them and saying, well, what is it? You know, if if in those times we had like 20 to 30,000 take this test, 500 will pass. If, if they're not performing is we fail. We didn't help them. We got to help them. And everyone has a niche. We got to find that niche. You got to have the time to do it. And a lot of the senior officers, I mean, I hate to say this, we now hold them accountable. It's in their evaluation. You will mentor and coach your people. You, we want to have a feedback from your staff. And mm-hmm. if you're not performing to those standards, then, hey, you know, as Secretary Powell and Secretary Rice and Clinton said, we'll find someone else who can and yeah. we do counseling letters. And yes, we had to relieve four people, but the secretary backed us up. And yeah. that is the issue is that we want to have everyone meet the standards, but also have the opportunities. That's what we need to make sure that they get the opportunities. I think that's that's wonderful. And I particularly like the idea of trying to help people find their, their, their niche where they belong. Because certainly anyone who can pass either that exam process or be selected for a Pickering Wrangle has the skills and the talent. So how do we make sure that we are taking, that we get the best out of them by helping them get the best out of themselves? Mm -hmm. We have a number of questions and I I very much encourage people to to put uh, your questions into the the Q&A. I have one from, I hope I don't mispronounce this name but too badly. Abdi Wagu, uh, he met you in, in Mogadishu. Uh, and he has, I think, advice that you are almost uniquely qualified to answer. Uh, what kind of advice do you, would you give to young diplomats um, who, go, who are sent to conflict zones? And, and unstable environments. Maybe both you and I could do a duet on that, but. Oh, sure. I mean, given your experience. <laughs> yeah, um, but I, I, to hear your, your views, what, what would you say to a young diplomat who is going out for their first or maybe their second or third um, high threat or conflict post? So, so right now is we had, you know, three war zones, but I mean, is we have uh, over two dozen um, high threat, high risk posts, which means a lot of them are unaccompanied uh, mm. or very limited. And those are in mostly in Africa, half of them in Africa and the other half, of course, Middle East, you have other areas. But the issue is that going to a war zone, especially like Mogadishu, Somalia, it's not for the faint hearted. And you really have to know what you're getting into. And I think that we had a lot of really intelligent people. I mean, very smart people. 
But once an 82 millimeter mortar comes in and we were getting six of them at a time, 20 to 50 yards in front of us, and they're loud. And once you hit it, you can't hesitate. You got to hit the ground, et cetera. And you have bullets flying in. And a lot of people, some people panicked. And you got to talk to them. You have to mentor them. But also you have to offer the opportunity to maybe this is not the place you should be. But the, the other issue too is that we also have a mission to accomplish and we have a duty. And if you volunteer to do the best to your ability, if you can't, then we understand and we'll send you to another assignment. Um, but war zones are very unique in what we have to achieve because in many ways it's stability, it's ending conflict and violence and trying to help people really explain and, and uh, harmonize uh, things that we're doing with our allied countries and the host nation is very difficult. So, I mean, I turn to you, uh, Pastor Bordin, because you, from your experience in Yemen and Kuwait and Iraq. Yeah, I, I'm, I think your advice is, is exactly spot on. Um, and I guess I would underscore that one particular point you made that remember what your mission is. Remember why you're there. Uh, it's sometimes a little hard when there's incoming fire, but um, if it's a full on war, uh, war zone, as you, you had in Somalia, probably more than you had counted on, um, that's, that's one issue. And if, if you really are not able to handle it, you need to, you need to say so. Um, I think sometimes I saw people who tried to hero their way through and they weren't coping and in that sense, they're doing neither themselves nor the mission. But I think the people who, who were able to handle these kinds of high stress situations best were those who kept their eye on what the mission was and kept their eye on what their, how their colleagues were doing. And you need to sort of think and get out of yourself uh, in order to, to do this. And then you do have to take some time to put yourself back together again. I think the people who pretended as if everything was fine is that there was no difference between Mogadiscio and Geneva were the ones who actually caused themselves the most harm and sometimes the mission. And, and I agree with you. The issue comes in is um, particularly in Mogadishu is you, you really need to create a team and to bring people together and anyone having a problem is to really kind of work with each other. And we kind of found it out, we, we, we did a lot of team building. So two, three people at a time to build up resiliency. Uh, but also I talked to every person every day, every, all the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you got it. I mean, and I know you did the same thing. You're, you're one of our, our, our models and, and mentors as well on how you handled, you know, Yemen was just a terrible, horrendous good challenge. And the same thing is we took some of your lessons learned to do that as well. Well, thank you. That's, that's very kind. Um, I think, that, yeah, I, I, to move on to another question, there's a, a very good question from uh, Dave Anderson, who is a current FSO. Um, and first of all, he wants to thank you for your, your leadership and your mentorship of AF. Um, and he wants to take the question on how to develop, retain, uh, encourage um, a, more, a more diverse, a, more, a, a richer uh, foreign service. And we tend to talk about it uh, from what should leaders do and what can leaders do. Um, what can entry-level and mid-level officers do to, to help with this process? They, they're as committed to improving the Foreign Service as the leadership should be. And, and that's really a great question because it, it cuts both ways. Mentorship, and I really like the word coaching because you're coaching people to fulfill their uh, skills and to find themselves. But on the other hand, we need to listen to the young uh, and to the incoming staff because they have ideas that may be very different, but could be a, a, a leader's uh, a learning experience. I'll give you an example. In, in Africa, we did a, a data survey for the secretary. We had 388 embassies and consulates we evacuated in a 30-year period. 
And a lot of them were in Africa. And we said, well, what's the cause of it? It's instability, it's coup d'etats, and of course, democracy and governance was the answer. But then we also need security. And so one of the things, and it was Susan Rice and Connie Newman and Johnny Carson and others, we said, let's have security by the Africans themselves. And everyone thought we were nuts, but these were advised by young officers. They said, why not? Let's do something different because the old way was not working. And he said, you know, today we, we, we just uh, trained 340,000 African troops in 25 countries. We don't have 80% of the peacekeepers from Europe, the US or South Asia, they're now from Africa. So it's completely different. And it's complete, it's, a, it's really a good program by the State Department. And it's a lesson learned, great thing. And so we need to look at areas and things and saying, yeah, let's work on it together. And, and really you need um, the leadership to have an open mind to what's possible, but also they need to look to see, can this, how does it pass the interagency? How does this develop? How can we make this successful? What are the things that we need to adjust? And so I think together we, we can do it. And, and if the core is over 60% of the core has less than 10 years, then we need to listen to our, our new staff and officers. Okay. Um, I have a question here from Scott Taylor, who is, is actually the, the vice dean um, at Georgetown for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, Scott was struck by your comment that much if not most of the diversity in uh, the foreign service is due to the Wrangell and Pickering programs. Is, is that an unintended consequence of these that state focuses less on recruitment and cultivation of diverse applicants through the foreign service test channel and is putting all of its recruitment on Wrangell Pickering. Um, what other uh, avenues would you suggest that the department be using or is Pickering Wrangell the best approach? Are we, do we have a good tool or, we, or do we need more tools? We need more tools, that, that, that's, that's clear. So as I was saying that the average age is between 32 and 35 entering the foreign service. Uh, and most of them enter through the exam process. The, the issue is that if we only have six to eight people who are actively recruiting full-time, six to eight people, oh, that, that's useless. I mean, DOD, when, so I, you know, I'm a, um, one of the co-presidents for the West Point Academy uh, Parents Association. I tell you, if they have, the academy is amazing, DOD. Every academy, duty, they have mentors, coaches out the gazoo, and we only have six to eight. That's 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 crazy. So, so what we're doing is we're picking up people on their second and third career. And the four A100 classes, the entering classes of officers that I've mentored, I noticed that 20 to 40 percent, depending on the class, were prior military. And so they already had the experience. So all we're doing is picking them up. What we need to do is more than just pick up. We need to develop and go and recruit. We need to go to uh, the predominantly uh, black colleges. We need to go to the middle state, middle America, Ohio State, uh, Tennessee, uh, Dakotas, Oklahoma. We need to go recruit. We need to show them why it's important that this matters. And but if you're a really high performing officer, it doesn't matter if you're Caucasian or African American or Hispanic. If you get a job offer from, you know, Wells Fargo or Bank of America, or you're going to another high tech company as Google or, or Microsoft, that, that's more alluring. But I think we need to show them that this is more than a job. It's a mission. It's mm -hmm. a mission for the United States, for the American people. It's in service to others duty. And so those yeah. are some of the things that is, is going to be hard, it's difficult, and we need to do a much, much better job. Much better. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I'm hearing is that there's a there's a compound problem um, that that the State Department has is that on one hand we haven't done uh, a very good job, and we you know I think everyone who's been in the department knows this. We're not we have not done a good job of explaining to the American people 
and their representatives in Congress, what diplomacy does for your ability to sell your crops, your ability to sell your goods, your ability to get things into this country, that the whole connection, the whole, that the service to country includes service to individuals, service to the economy, service all the way down uh, to the middle America farmer to, to use a stereotype. And because we're not able to, we've not been successful in conveying that, their, their children, they don't understand why you would even want to join the State Department or even that there is a State Department or that there is even is a diplomatic corps because they don't see the connection. They don't see the profession either. Is, is that a fair comment that we're yes, yes. using both ways? Yes. Yeah. And, 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 you know, that's really raises another area that I kind of looked at it, the African Bureau looked at it with Middle East Bureau and, uh, and the Latin American Bureau. So for in a lot of areas, we send our officers to Middle America because the diaspora is so important. And by doing that, they not only learn about the diaspora, but they learn about the communities they live in. And for some of our officers, they've never been to, let's say, um, some parts of the United States. And by learning that experience, they can convey what they do, we as foreign service officers, but they also learn what is it on the minds of middle America and also the coastal areas about the American communities? And I'll give you one example is, so we went to Iowa. So Iowa is really important to the United States. Why? Because when you have malnutrition or other things, we need plumping it, which is called enhanced nutrition. And where is the best place? Iowa. That's where they produce it. And because we had floods in Iowa, we were short of plumping that. That's terrible. And therefore, we told the farmers, you are our heroes. You are heroes. And they said, thank you. And this is great. The other areas, too, is, is one of the things is migration. So migration becomes a very politicized issue. But the fact of the matter is, is that if you look overseas, is that they look at the United States as a country of tremendous opportunities but also for answers to their problems. A lot of them are coming because of climate problems and other issues. And so if we're gonna have higher migrations, then we as foreign service officers, a lot of things that we're doing to building governance and building development, that's gonna help. And, and those are areas that we can explain to the American public, which we don't do good, well enough. And that's mm -hmm. what we need to do better. Mm -hmm. And you're roughly correct in what you said. Yes, and, and, and I also very much support your that we need far more recruiters. Um, we will never be able to match the military. Uh, but uh, when I was a diplomat in residence, I, I had the entire state of California. <laughs> so, um, and I put a lot of miles on the car. Um, to kind of bring it down to some of the, the more practical questions that we're, we're getting um, is what, what, what should a student or a person who is looking to, to come into the service, um, what should, how should they be preparing themselves? Undergraduate, graduate, work experience, uh, what makes for not just a competitive applicant to the service, but a somebody with the skill set, the intellectual skill set to have a successful career. Mm. And that's, that's really, each person is unique. You know, Voltaire said, never judge a person by the answers they provide, but by the questions they ask. Ooh, and it's like really the questions and the curiosity, intellectual curiosity. And so for me, if, if I did biochemistry and math, you know, and, and I said, wow, these questions that these uh, former foreign service officers were asking, that's, that's fascinating. And it's, it's learning and it's experiencing. And I think is what you, the skills you bring to the mission is important. And those are, are, are really critical. And, um, is, and I think that, um, you know, graduate school is good, college is good, but what's really good is, do you have the desire, the commitment, the, the enthusiasm, in other words, the grit 
to see the mission through and in hard situations and say, you know, this is for the United States. It's about us as a country, as an American. That's, this is a, this is not a job. This is so unusual for anything you could ever do. You can work at a bank, you can work at a company. Yeah, you'll make money, but you know, this is what it is. And we recruited one person from Goldman Sachs and he just said, you know, I had it. I want to do something for the United States. I want to do something for the people. Yeah, um, I actually may have been working with you on that group, and I and there, <laughs> there's been more than one. There's been more than one, but that that sort of segues to a, I think a very good question that has come in from Janine, that when we have so many issues at home, so much that we need to do uh, in our own country for our own country. Um, why, if I am either a, a person in a career looking for something different or I'm a student uh, going to university, um, why should I be going abroad? Uh, why should I be interested in foreign affairs? Why, why should I be taking my talents and my time and, and spending it elsewhere instead of investing it in my own country? And what we do in the United States affects the world. And what happens around the world affects the United States. It's interrelated and we have to really understand that. And I know right now climate is, is this an issue, but I'll give you one practical issue. So when I was in Japan, China, and Ethiopia, we were selling American goods and services. And one of them was Boeing aircraft. So Ethiopia, one of the poorest countries, bought over $12 billion in Boeing aircraft. You know how many jobs they saved in America, but more important, how many jobs did they save in France? Because France uh, does a lot of the uh, the windows, the Japanese do the wings, uh, uh, the UK does the engine parts, et cetera. So, and then in America, you have uh, manufacturers in North Carolina, Missouri, Washington State, Minnesota. It's, it's, it's really uh, affects the United States and my two, uh, I had two uncles who worked for Boeing aircraft and they said, thank you foreign countries for buying Boeing aircraft. And so it helped American uh, jobs. So that's in a practical way. And on the other side too, is we are also exporting values. The values of the United States, uh, democratic values, um, girls education, because that's critical, um, you know, equality. Uh, and that means we have a brand that we need to protect to defend and, and advance. And I'll give you one example is that um, we, when I was in Afghanistan, we had in, in the Southern part, we had less than 20% girls education and those communities were not developing. In the North, we got to 40% and they were expanding. It was based on what we were learning in Africa about expanding girls' education, you can stabilize uh, communities and economies. And that was a lesson learned. And that's why we do it. Very few people do it. I mean, Europe, Japan do, but we, the United States, that's our brand. And that's what we stand for. Yeah. And I, I think there's something uh, I might also add, if I may, is that to the extent that other countries are are stable, prosperous, are able to provide education to their students, provide decent health care, that directly affects us as well. I mean, I think what we know from COVID, what we saw with Ebola, what we know about terrorism, uh, and what we know about uh, immigration is that to the extent that other countries are not able to cope with their challenges, and many of those challenges do come back to climate change, and they are generally not the uh, contributors. But to the extent you have these problems of economic and personal dislocation and instability, that does have a direct impact on us. And so I think we need to get away from the idea that there are domestic issues and international issues. It's you're dealing with those issues either abroad or at home, but they are no longer protected by two oceans. And so I think you're doing both when you're working uh, in this field. Yes. yes. Um, Don, I think we're, we're starting to, to wrap up on the hour. Um, and I, I, this has been, I think, a, a, a very rich and 
enjoyable conversation. Um, I want to thank those who participated for the questions and comments. We didn't get to quite all of them. Um, and, and Don, I'd like to turn it over to you to, for any closing thoughts that you'd like to give. I, I think for all of us is, again, if I can just emphasize that this is a mission and what we do matters, not only to the American public, but also to the international community. And really all of us, every service person I've met in the services has that commitment of in service to others. And that's really what distinguishes us as Americans, as diplomats from other countries. Thank you. Thank you. And I wanna thank you all today for joining us. Uh, Don, welcome back uh, to, to Washington. And um, thank you all. And we will be, we will have this um, up on our website in a few weeks. And I do invite you all again to visit diversediplomacyoneword.com uh, to see the library of uh, previous interviews that we've had with a remarkable range of foreign service professionals. So thank you all and have a good afternoon. And thank you, Don. Nice to see you again. No, thank you very much.